Hello, and welcome to Keep Teaching Strategies and Considerations. Today's motto, Keep Calm and Teach On, is all about reflecting the fact that you know what you're doing, you know how to teach, and right now we're just rethinking how that happens. But teaching is why we're here, and teaching today, and teaching is what we're going to talk about. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Director of Faculty Development and Instructional Support here with the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. Before we get too far, I do want to point out that we have a whole website of resources to go along with this workshop. I'll put the link into the text chat for those of you joining us live, but the session is, or the link is, keepteaching.niu.edu. So this site has a wealth of ideas and resources to help you get started in thinking how you deliver your courses for the next few weeks. I'll refer to some of the specific features and specific contents of that site as well as we go. I have to admit, I'm a huge Disney fan. It's a little bit embarrassing, I suppose, as an adult, but I am. And so every time I would say something like, well, it's just about keeping teaching or we just need to keep teaching, it reminded me of Dory. So in the movie Finding Dory, Dory is a, a blue tang here. I believe that's what they are. I worked for a while at an aquarium. And I could be wrong, though. This was a number of years ago. Anyhow, she has a memory issue, and she doesn't, isn't able to retain memories. And so often, in the middle of doing something, she'll forget where she is or why she's doing something. And her mantra is just keep swimming. So my, my f I guess, first tip to all of you is if you're feeling lost or confused or you don't know what to do or where to go, just keep teaching. This is what you do. It's what you know and love. And remembering that that's what we're here. That's what we're here for, uh, for our students, is to just keep teaching. They need that continuity. And even if you don't know exactly where you're going, you know where you are right now. And that's something to build on as you keep moving. That being said, from a perhaps a more academic perspective, as we were putting together our own resources and this workshop, we were looking to what other universities were doing, and we found some really great quotes that I want to share. The first one from Brown University is that in times of significant disruption, the key goal is to help students get the support they need to meet your most essential course objectives. There are two things about that statement that I love. One is remembering this is about helping your students get the support they need. So again, putting that focus on students and getting them through this as well. And then the second one is the focus on the most essential course objectives. This is the first time I'll say it, and I'll say it multiple times. You'll probably need to let things go. I did not go for the Elsa Let It Go reference just to, to calm you down. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the most calming song or sentiments, but you may need to let some of your, your course objectives go, and, but by focusing on what's most essential about your course, that will help you prioritize and set your goals and your direction as you keep your teaching moving forward. The second quote that I want to share is from Indiana University, and their quote is this, it's not just about content. If a crisis is disrupting classes, lectures can mean more than just providing course content. They also establish a sense of normalcy and a personal connection. And I would modify this, instead of focusing specifically on lectures, I would say teaching. Right now, teaching is more than the content that you might be sharing with students or the content that they're learning. Right now, your connections to them matter more. And any sense of normalcy and continuity that you can provide during this time is going to be the most valuable thing that you can do for them. I think we're all feeling disrupted. <laughs> I know I certainly am. And, and this sense of, again, connection and, and continuity, that through line is going to be important so that students don't feel that, that their courses, their education is disrupted as well. But how do you actually go about getting started with this? It's, it's well enough to so focus and center us on those two tips. But 
what what about the the bigger picture do we need to think about and so my first tip for you is communicate early and communicate often your students are potentially still wondering what's going to happen how this is going to work they've heard from the university they know that uh, the general plan of how courses will continue, but they don't know, they have maybe not have not heard from you. They don't know how you're going to continue your course. To be fair, you may not know yet either, but it's still important to communicate with them, to let them know that you're here, to let them know that you care and that this is something you're working on. Uh, you can assure them that you will offer additional options or flexibility, that you are in tune with their needs and you're thinking about their needs. And that can help them feel, feel more assured and more supported as they move forward. So if you haven't done so yet, I would suggest adding an announcement to your course or sending an email and just let them know you're here, you're thinking about them, and that more details will be available as soon as you have them. It's worth noting that in, the, in times of other crises on campus, when other um, issues have arisen, the, the student's number one ask of administration of the university is let us know that you know that there's a situation. We know you don't have the answers yet, but let us know that you are aware of it and that you are working on it. So my second tip then, is to set realistic goals. Again, this is multifaceted. Set realistic goals for yourself on what you're going to accomplish in your, your teaching plan right now and set realistic goals for your students as well. So students' lives are being disrupted just as ours are and they may have additional demands on their time right now. They may have uncertainty about their, their work or income or housing. And in the midst of that, it becomes even more difficult for them to focus on their coursework. So set realistic goals for what you will be able to accomplish in rethinking your course and don't take too much on yourself. And at the same time, be realistic about what you, you burden on your students at this time as well. Once you have that in mind, thinking about your, your schedule and your content really becomes a matter of setting priorities. You have already established, or you can at this time establish, what your most essential course objectives are. What are the things that students need more than anything else in your course? And focus on those first. And then as you look at your schedule for the semester, the, the first accommodation that you can make in your teaching is rethinking the schedule or the order in which you are addressing things. So if you had a, a big project that students were going to be presenting in two weeks, it may be better to wait and have them do that once we're hopefully back in classrooms and back to a sense of normalcy, as opposed to adopting a lot of technology and trying to do that now because that's what the schedule said we were going to do now. So this is a great opportunity to pause and reflect on what's most important that you accomplish now and perhaps what is the easiest thing to accomplish now and what can you accomplish later uh, using different techniques or strategies. So do feel like you have that freedom, you do, to adjust your schedule and, and reprioritize what happens. The key to this though is also having open and frequent communication with your students. So if you are adjusting your schedule and swapping some topics or some expectations, be sure that that's clear to students, that they know those expectations and that they are on board with you at the same time. And then I also encourage you to think about students' technology and not just about their time. So when you're teaching a fully online course, your students know from the beginning what will be expected of them. They know the technology that's going to be required and they've made arrangements to have access to that. Right now, students who are in our face-to-face -face courses may not be prepared for a fully online course. They may not have, uh, particularly if they are at home 
with their families. They may not have access to high-speed internet. They may not have access to a laptop or a computer uh, that, that's theirs. <laughs> Just even on Friday, I was saying they might be going to a library to use it. And now most, if not all, of our community libraries have closed for the duration of this pandemic. So we don't know what technology students have available. Uh, we've been trying to make recommendations that are as broadly uh, suitable despite technology so that students could participate from a, a mobile device, from a smartphone in their online course. But it's worth considering that and thinking about that before you inundate them with a, a great deal of technology that they have to cope with. One key example of that is having a webcam or a microphone to participate in uh, something like this or in something like test proctoring. If they don't have that, that's not something that they can probably get on short notice and it's really probably unfair to ask them to. So tools like Collaborate and others have telephone dial-in options or they have mobile options that allows a student who doesn't have a computer suited for those tools to still be able to participate. It's worth at this point also pointing out that these photos, with actually the exception of the cell phone photo, are all of our students in classes here at NIU or, or around in our open spaces. So this is actually a KNPE course. And I, it's just such an amusing photo by this point in the, the workshop. So I, I wanna stress that it's important right now to be flexible. So that, you may plan to go one direction this week, and maybe by Wednesday you find that things just aren't working the way you thought they would. Be flexible, change your approach or change your, <laughs> the way that you're um, addressing that, that issue. I also want you to be flexible with your students. So the next few weeks are probably not the best time to have rigid attendance policies or late work policies. You can still set those, but it's important to be clear with students about them and as much as possible to be flexible to their own personal needs and accommodations. They may be caring for children or parents or just, again, relatives and loved ones who are uh, often cared for elsewhere, children in school, for example, who are now home, or who might be ill. They themselves might be ill. And so I think the the most important thing out of all of this is probably summed up in my final tip, which is extending grace. Extending grace to students, allowing them to perhaps work a little outside the norms or expectations that you would normally set for them. But also, really importantly, is extending grace to yourself. I know that this is an uncomfortable time for everyone, and you probably won't feel like you are at your best, but Extend some grace to yourself, forgive yourself, and be willing to, again, not be at your best. Uh, stepping out of your comfort zone and being okay when maybe it doesn't work so well. Um, understanding that there will be technical issues that we all just have to accept and, and work through. And having the, <laughs> the grace to admit to yourself that it's okay. We, academics, we are all very, achievement oriented and we always want to feel like we we are doing exceptional work and doing our best work and so the most difficult thing out of all of this is probably being willing to accept that if you are uncomfortable if you don't feel like you're knowing you know quite what you're doing that that's okay right now and we'll get through this all together and that there are supports here namely us as well as your colleagues and and others within your departments who are able to help you and provide guidance and, and support. But all of that is, is all well and good. And in the first workshop, uh, <laughs> someone appreciated my Pollyanna optimism and wanted it bottled. So with that in mind, how do you actually do this though? My, my optimism and my forgiveness of you on your behalf only gets so far, you still have to actually do this. So the rest of this workshop then, I'll focus on some specific tools and strategies that you may want to make use of. And I will then, uh, lots of time at the end for you to be able to ask questions about your own courses or about tools that we've mentioned. So that this is more than just me talking, 
but you have plenty of time to, to interact and ask some questions of me. So first up, I, as I picked these, I chose three, um, three kind of common teaching approaches that I think most of you will have to come up against. This isn't the totality of what you will need to address, but at least the, the three most common areas. And the first one is finding solutions for lectures. And again, I'm not just assuming that these are lectures like you um, droning on forever like I have been, but your typical interactive class session where you might talk for a while, students will talk, they'll talk to each other, you'll have activities. There are a variety of tools that you can use in order to uh, replace temporarily those in-class sessions. So the first one that probably has the lowest friction in order to move into and get started with would be to hold your class online with Blackboard Collaborate or another web conferencing tool. So what this allows you to do is take your regular class time that your face-to-face -face course was assigned and the, the PowerPoint slides that you may have already um, prepared or really anything you had prepared for your in-class session, if that was a software demonstration or looking at um, a series of images and potentially even a video, and holding that class online synchronously in web conferencing. You can then record it. So instead of requiring that every student attend in person, you can record it and allow them to watch it at their own time when they're more available um, for that flexibility. And then it can be highly interactive. So your students can use audio and video. They can use um, the, the chat on the, the right. There are polling tools so that you can ask questions. And there are whiteboard tools that you can use to interact with them and, and have them build something on the, the whiteboard tool in front of you. With Collaborate, you can use, you can upload files like a PowerPoint or a PDF or an image, but you can also use what's called Application Share. And Application Share lets you show anything that is on your computer screen. So if you had software to demonstrate or a website to walk through, you can show students that and then uh, talk about it as you do that. I would also encourage you after you considered meeting live, instead consider using open education resources or other sources of content. So there's a wealth of content that's already created that you may be able to add into your course in order to provide students with time and flexibility. So instead of spending all of the time and effort for you to uh, build something or recreate something, you can check with uh, a variety of open education resource sites that uh, have content that other academics have already created to share with your students. These are freely available. They are licensed so that you can use them without a fee for you or your students and offers you a really easy road to entry. I'll also add that the, um, the publishers have really been stepping up in providing support during this time. So it's highly likely that your textbook publisher has provided additional resources that would normally be behind uh, a paywall, something students would have to pay to use, that now the publisher is providing freely. So I would also recommend checking with your publisher in order to find out if that would be an option for you. I'm going to share in the text chat, the library has created a libguide. It's libguides.niu.edu slash continuity that provides a number of sources and resources that you could make use of in order to find additional content or material that you would share with your students. I am going to pause for a moment. I saw Claire asked, how do you enter Collaborate? I've tried all the tutorials, but none of them give me the URL to actually enter the site. So the easiest way to enter the site is through your Blackboard course, as Tracy mentioned. So within your Blackboard course, if you're in the original course view, you would go to tools in your menu, and Blackboard Collaborate is listed as one of those tools. 
once you're in the scheduler then there are uh, you can enter your course room which is already created or you can schedule a new session I will uh, find and post for you the link to our Blackboard resources, although I know you've said you've already gone through them. But for anyone else who's interested, here is the, the link to our Collaborate page. We are also holding workshops on Blackboard Collaborate. The one for today is full, but we do have another one tomorrow and I will provide that link. It is tomorrow from, which is Tuesday, March 17th from three to four. And so you could register to attend that session and we'll walk through everything you need to know about getting started with and using Collaborate in your courses. Claire, I would suggest following up with me after the workshop and I'll take a look and see what's going on with your course. So then the next option, if you don't want to hold sessions live and you've perhaps looked and there aren't resources available that you'd like to use, would be to create something yourself. And there are many ways in, for you to create content and post it in your course. And if this is something you've done in the past, then you're, you're well on your way to, to doing it again. Uh, but we have two recommendations for how you would do this that have kind of the lowest barriers to entry. They are the, the most streamlined options for you to use. Both are integrated within Blackboard and allow you to uh, easily create and record some lectures for your course. The first one that we'll recommend is VoiceThread. So VoiceThread is uh, an audiovisual tool in Blackboard when you create a, a new voice thread, you can upload content that you may already have, such as a PowerPoint presentation or images or a PDF. And then you can add narration over that just like you would in your, your live class session. With voice thread, you can record that audio via a microphone, such as a headset mic or your laptop microphone. But you can also do it via telephone. So voice thread actually gives you a phone number to call in order to be able to record via your, your phone call instead of any of these other um, solutions. So again, it provides you with the, the most um, straightforward and most flexible options for how you record audio. And then if you are using more uh, software, or you need to demonstrate uh, the use of a website in your class, your best solution is to use some type of screencasting tool. So we are, um, we've been piloting a new tool this semester called Kaltura that is a video streaming platform. Uh, but in the meantime, we are implementing for, for this um, situation in particular, Kaltura Capture. We're opening that up more broadly to the university. So Kaltura Capture lets you record whatever is on your computer screen. That could be slides uh, like a PowerPoint presentation, but it could also be a demonstration in Excel or in a specialized tool that you use for your courses. It does require the use of a, a microphone, whether that's the, the headset you plug in or a laptop microphone. So it's not quite as flexible with audio, but it is closer than um, some of the other tools because it is integrated within Blackboard. Uh, so Angela asks, does VoiceThread include the closed captioning for you or do you have to type this yourself? So that is an excellent question and it's a good time to mention accessibility as one of the other considerations that you should be thinking about. For media that you create, we do recommend that you close caption it. It is required by law that it, things are closed captioned. Both VoiceThread and Kaltura have auto captioning features that will make a first pass at having captions for you. The, um, they're not perfect, of course. Kaltura's are actually really good. They're better than YouTube's. Um, I haven't played as much with voice threads to know how accurate theirs are, so I'm not gonna speak to that, unfortunately. But once those, once those tools have automatically captioned your work, then you're further ahead to, to revise and make some edits to that to make it more accurate. Uh, but yes, those are, those are both great solutions for ensuring accessibility of your content. If you're holding a live session, like in Collaborate, then uh, generally 
you only need to have captions of the live event if there's a student with an accommodation need in your course. If you do have a student who's been having CART transcription services or a sign language interpreter, and you want to use web conferencing sessions, the Disability Resource Center is ready to help you. So if you have a student who's been utilizing those services, I strongly encourage you to connect with them as soon as possible on how those services can continue while your face-to-face -face course transitions to remote delivery. Uh, their transcriptionists can and will help with uh, injecting live captions into your Collaborate or web conferencing session, and they can do that remotely just as well. So do reach out if that is a need that you have in your courses. I should also add at this point, we do have workshops coming up uh, today and through the rest of the week, through Thursday, on both VoiceThread and Kaltura Capture, if those are tools that you're interested in trying to use. And the library is holding sessions throughout this week on their resources and how you can work with the library in order to identify some additional content or additional approaches for your courses. The second strategy that I think everyone needs to address at some point in the next, next few weeks are solutions for assessments. Again, depending on what assessments you've had in your course, you may need to also rethink your approaches to those. So if you are going to have students hand in something um, that they've created, particularly if they've created electronically, if they were going to turn in a, a Word document that they printed and handed in or deliver, um, send in a, an Excel file that they had worked on, the easiest way to collect those during our remote teaching window will be using a Blackboard assignment. So Blackboard assignments allow you to create a submission point in your Blackboard course so that students can attach their file and submit it to Blackboard almost like they would have if they were attaching it to an email to you. Blackboard then organizes them for you, which your email won't, and then you don't have to worry about trying to organize or find or match up students with particular courses. And then you can grade those through Blackboard as well, uh, adding comments directly in the file or adding general feedback overall, and provide then a grade to the student that they can access through Blackboard. We have uh, also the ability to deliver online exams in Blackboard. The, the test tool allows you to ask both objective, like multiple choice or true false or matching questions, as well as fill in the blank. Blackboard will grade those automatically for you, which is great. You can then also on a test include open-ended questions like short answer or essay questions that Blackboard won't grade for you, unfortunately, but uh, allows you to deliver that exam within a controlled environment um, while they're, they're writing their responses to the open-ended questions. For, like I said, for right now, we are not recommending proctoring for these online exams. Uh, while we do have solutions for that for online courses, there are technology requirements that students just may not be able to meet right now and you'd be putting a barrier in their way to be able to uh, participate in your course. Instead, you will likely need to rethink these exams as uh, more, more open, potentially open book, although you can ask students not to use additional resources. Uh, you may want to set a timer in order to limit the amount of time that students can take on the exam and uh, use additional questions so that you can randomize the questions an individual student receives. If possible, I would also recommend thinking about the types of questions you ask and trying to make those higher order thinking questions so that there's less likelihood that they could quickly look up an answer if they have to analyze or um, apply information in some way. But then, Assuming that this is a, a short interruption, and right now it's scheduled as a two-week interruption, you could consider postponing any high-stakes exams until we're face-to-face -face in our classrooms again. And then the final thought is to replace your exams entirely with an alternative assessment. Um, again, this would require some clear communication and some justification to your students, but given the circumstances, if there were instead a an assignment or a task that students could complete instead of taking an online exam, I would encourage you to think about that as well. 
And then moving right along, oh, let me back up for just a second to also point out that we do have workshops for uh, creating assignments and tests this week scheduled as well. So if you have not done that before in Blackboard, we have resources available as well as we will have workshops every day on those two tools. And then the final area that we'll look at is a solution for discussions and for group work. Anytime that you were wanting students to collaborate or in class to, to speak and debate about a, a text or a topic. Some of these tools will be familiar and some of them um, might be a new approach. So the first one is, again, if you were going to have students have a discussion in class, you could move that discussion online via Blackboard Collaborate. With the flexibility tool offers, students could join live or they could watch a recording and maybe write a reflection on what they would add to the discussion. You could hold, um, have students participate via their computer browser with a microphone. They could dial in via telephone or via their smartphone. They could join the session altogether. So there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of ways for students to participate in that session. But you could also hold the discussion asynchronously, meaning students are at different times, with a discussion board in Blackboard. The discussion board is a threaded discussion tool, so one student posts and another student replies and can reply and can reply in order to build that conversation. Um, the discussion board in Blackboard is fairly straightforward to use. You would initially um, present the question to students or the instructions for their assignment and then they can reply to each other. Excuse me. And again, we're holding a workshop on discussion boards this week as well, both on the, the, the how to, the technical side, and then a little bit of the pedagogical side for considering how you establish and set up those discussions. And then on a voice thread presentation, just as you can use audio to narrate your presentation, students can actually pause that presentation in order to respond to it. So you could ask that, ask a question in your VoiceThread presentation and then ask that students actually comment back to answer that question. They can do so via text, not text message, but they can type in, in the VoiceThread tool their response. They can respond via audio, again, via microphone, laptop mic, or, or telephone, or they could turn on their webcam and record a short video all on that presentation. And it integrates into Blackboard for you to easily grade it or provide participation credit for it. And then if students were working collaboratively on a project, you might encourage them to meet via Collaborate or whatever um, video chat tool they're comfortable with so that they can continue to discuss their work and plan. And th then they can collaborate on that actual product with a document, presentation, spreadsheet, uh, all in Office 365. So every student has online access through their browser to the, uh, the full Office suite. They have that for free that NIU has provided for years now. And similar to a Google Doc, they can participate there with their NIU logins and accounts. So those are the three areas that I wanted to highlight in particular. I know there are so many more uh, strategies that, or teaching techniques that you would have been using face-to-face. -face. Um, so I'm, after I wrap up here, I'm happy to take those as questions or uh, we can meet with you individually to talk through some of those approaches. But these are all very flexible strategies that may meet your needs anyhow. But some final thoughts for you. I wanna revisit that Brown University quote because Again, the most important thing for us to remember is that we're helping students to get the support they need to learn. And what our job is then is providing that support and prioritizing what are those most essential course objectives. So do think about that. This is, this is unprecedented and uh, requires some real creative problem solving in order to accomplish this. And then I wanna make sure that you remember that you can go to keepteaching.niu.edu for more 
ideas, strategies, resources. We've started a section of, of guides in order to help with specific technical tasks. Um, and we'll be adding to that continuously this week and next week. And then finally, there are a range of ways to connect with us. Uh, we are scaling back on in-person consultations or, or support just because of the, the added risk involved for all of us. We want to make sure you're safe and healthy as well as we are safe and healthy. So we have um, coming up one-on-one -on -one consultation opportunities that you can schedule a specific time to meet with us. The URL is, the short URL is go.niu.edu slash consultations, but I'll put the link into the text chat as well so that um, you can quickly click and sign up. Those will be automatically assigned to one of our team members uh, who can meet with you, as I said, either online via Collaborate or via phone. By the way, if you're considering using Blackboard Collaborate for your courses and you want more time to try it out and uh, get feedback on, on whether or not things are working, an online consultation is a great way to do that. We, right now, we have availability for the next two weeks that you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of us. And then we also have additional workshops coming up through Thursday of this week. And that URL is go.niu.edu slash KT workshops. And I've put that in the text chat as well for quick reference. So those are going to cover additional topics related to recording uh, with VoiceThread or with Kaltura Capture using the Blackboard assessment tools, including assignments and tests, creating online discussions, using Blackboard Collaborate, and additional resources with the library that can help support your course transformations. With that, I do want to thank you all for joining and remember <laughs> to keep calm and teach on and just keep teaching. I'm going to stop the recording so that as you ask questions, those are more confidential and not kept on that recording. So hold on just a moment.